Hey team, welcome back to my channel. In this video, we're going to use the program Wordle and then we're going to write a solver. You know, how can you solve the unknown word? Hope you enjoy this video. As you can see, I just loaded up Wordle and it's asking me to select like a first word. So over here in my app, I'm going to say a four and then I'm going to come over here inside of Wordle and I'm going to select that word as well. And then I'm going to hit enter to see if I have any letters and notice that it gave me two options. So I come back to my program and I say, okay, O is green and E is yellow, gold. And then I'm going to say search. Notice right now I have 9,330 rows. Now the set has been limited down to just 34 rows. So now I come up there and I say, okay, what would be my next word? Well, how about we uh, say um, uh, well, these are all just horrible words. How about we say uh, emoji? And then I'm going to come over here and I'm going to say uh, emoji. Uh, e M O J I and then say enter. And notice now that we have selected another one. So I come and say, okay, you're green, you're green, and uh, that's it. So now I say search. Now we're down to eight. Now here are my options. So I'm going to go with, um, I'm going to go with ebook. And let's see if that one's here. So I come over here and I say E B O O K. Enter. And that was nothing. So you're back to green, you're to green, and then I hit search again. And notice we're now down to five. And how about we say epoch? So E P O C H. Enter. And I'm getting close. So E P O, and there is no C H in there. And now it looks like we only have one word left. So I'm going to say E P O X Y E P O X Y search. And I was able to get it. And that is how Word Wordle Solver can help you. Let's load up Visual Studios. Notice I'm using Microsoft Visual Studios Enterprise 2022. We're going to say File, New, Project. The goal is we want to load up one called WPF Application. You can come over here if you don't have it in Recents. You can say C Sharp Windows Desktop. Find it. Once you find it, say Next. Then what is our project name? We're going to call this Wordle Solver. And then uh, Output Directory, that's your local computer. The solution name will be called Wordle Solver. Hit Next. And we're going to be using .NET 6 long-term support. Now that we've created this, we will load up View Solution Explorer. And notice our files. We need to create a folder right away. Let's go right click and say add folder. And we're going to create a folder called app data. Inside of app data, we're going to create a file, a JSON file, to put all the words in that solve this problem. So say add a new item and see where it says uh, web. Then we're going to say JSON file. And once that goes in there, let's just rename that. F2, and we'll call that a words.json. Now that right there, we're going to go download a file and then put all those words into JSON, this file, word.json, and that will solve a big part of this problem. But we're going to do that later. And there you have the project all set up, ready to go. Let's look at our Solution Explorer one more time. Right-click on Hurdle Solver, 
come down and see manage NuGet packages. Then we're going to search for Newton soft browse. And then notice this guy right here, 13.0.1, and then say install. Okay. And now we have all of our dependencies, the project is set up. We just need to start writing the code now. We are now ready to begin typing in the XAML for this project. Let's see what the app looks like one more time. Notice that we have a title. We have something that is 800 pixels long. We have it 665 wide. That's height and width. And then we have a title bar called Wordle Solver by Software Nuggets. Then we have a matrix. Look at this. It's a five by six. Five characters, and we get six chances. And then we have a search button, a clear button, and then a list to pick words. Let's first update this line right here. Notice the title, Wordle Solver by Software Nuggets. You can type whatever you want here. And then height and width. Let's make sure we use 800 by 665. After we get done writing this, you want to make changes. The code is yours, and you do as you see fit. Let's give this grid a name and a margin. Notice the name of it is going to be called the board. Now don't change this because we're going to be using this in the source code. So this is a very important variable name. So we need to build column definitions and row definitions. And what I want you to do is just watch me do it and then it'll make you go a little faster. Now what I want you to do is type in lines 12 and 13. And once you're done typing that in, just highlight that, and we're gonna copy this several more times. Remember, each word has five characters. So that's two characters, three characters, four characters, five characters. And then we're gonna put a space after that. And why are we doing that? Well, let's go look at the app one more time. So notice I have like a little gap here, and then I have a whole nother section. Well, we have to account for that in our column definitions. So here's the finished column definitions. Notice that we have one, two, three, four, five. That's for the characters. We got a little gap, and then we have a 240 for that list. Now notice that I have these sixes in between each of them. Well, if we come down here and look at that little spacer, some people call that a gutter or, you know, like other terms, I'm not sure. But it's just a spacer between each character. If I look at the form again, notice I just have spaces between all of our controls, and that's the goal. Make sure your grid.column definition starts at line 11 and stops at line 26, and you have all of these offset. Hit pause now to make sure you're on target. We're now ready to work on grid.row definitions. Let's do the same thing we did in column definitions. Let's put in our two lines, highlight that, and then let's block copy that down until we finish. It should look like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven sixties. And then notice at the very bottom, we have a star that represents, hey, give me the rest of the, the height. Notice that we went from lines 27 to 43. Notice down here you see this big 240. Now, what number is that? So what we do is we start here at 0. So that's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So in column 12, we're going to create another grid. Let's do that. Let's now create a grid inside of a grid. Notice I'm going to reference row zero. You can see that this is row zero. I just showed you what column 12 meant. And now row span, that means, hey, I want to start here. And look at this. I want to go all the way down to the bottom. So that is that grid. This is the area that we're going to try to build now. We only need a row definition for this grid. So let's build something that has a row definition of 40, 6, and then star. I think you understand what all these mean. 
Let's now add this search button and the clear button to this first row. As you can see here on line 52, I'm putting in a stack panel. The orientation is called horizontal and I'm using grid.row0. That is this line right here. Notice I have two buttons. My first button is called button search. My second button is called button clear all. Content is how we get the word search and clear all inside of the button. So content equals search, content equals clear all. My search button is a little bit bigger than my width because later on we're going to add the number of words that are inside of the list there. So width 130. The clear button will never change and its width is 105. Now when our users click on the search button or the clear button, these are the methods that will be used. So on the search, it's btn button search underscore click. And on the clear button, button clear all click. And there's just a little margin so I can put a little, little gutter between these two. And that is up there in row definition, sub zero, row zero. You can see that we're using that same gap in between our fields. Notice I have another height of six. You saw me use that in the other section. Now we're ready to type in the list box. Notice that's over here in this light KN color. So notice I say list box X colon name. This is the name of our control. It's called L box all words. That is where we're going to put all the words when someone does a search. Then notice that is on grid.row2. If we come back here and look at our row definitions, 0, 1, 2. I hope you understand what row definitions means. I'm going to collapse this. So notice I have a action. So what happens is when a, someone clicks on an individual word, it's going to call a method called L box all words selection changed. Set the background color the horizontal alignment to left, the vertical alignment to top, the width to 235, and the height to 616. Here is just a sneak preview of what your form should start looking at. We have the area where we have our tiles for the individual characters. We have a search button, we have a clear button, and we have a list. We need to keep defining the list though. I just wanted to give you a preview. After you finish typing in lines 60 to 66, we're now ready to begin the listbox.item template. Notice the item template begins at line 68 and finishes in line 84. So listbox.item template down to close listbox.item template. Then we're going to say on line 69, data template. That goes down to close data template. And then we're going to put a grid inside of this object. Notice we're using a row definition and I'm saying the row height is 25. The column is 160. And then what we're going to do inside of this one column, we're going to make the font size 16 and then I'm going to bind that with the word that is going to come from our list. And that is the name of the field that is in that object. And we're going to put the foreground color to black. So finish lines 68 to 84, and then we can continue. Press pause now. We're going to close the grid. We're going to close the main grid, and then we're going to close the window. Guess what, team? We are done typing in all the XAML for this project. Congratulations. We are now ready to begin our c -sharp programming. Notice that I have created three new class objects, cell color types, character, used, state type, and five letter words. How do you get these? Is you just come here and right click and say add and then class. And when this pops up, do this three times. One for cell color type, the next one for character, used, state type, and five letter words. Do that three times. Now when you have finished that, let's go into cell color type. Notice this is an enum, and that is why I call it cell color and then type. All my enums, I always use type at the end. That's just a convention 
I use, that doesn't mean you have to. But for this program, can you please do it like this? And then when we're all done, change it to the way you do it. So here we have dark gray, gold, and green. Just so you can see how I use those, here is dark gray, here is gold, and here is green. I know that by zero, one, and two. So cell color type, very, very important. Our next uh, enum is character used state. And then because this is an enum, I just say type at the end. So character used state, it's a type to me. So we have something that's init, initialized, success and failed, zero, one, and two. I use this to control state management for this app. This again is a very important object. Our last class, five letter words, notice I say public strings and then a question mark that makes this a nullable and the variable name is called word. Do you remember when we did our XAML and we created a list and I said, make it look like word? Here, we're gonna bind with word, and that word comes from five letter words. So see how this whole program is just working itself together? If you are new to JSON and deserialized JSON, go to my channel, youtube.com slash software nuggets videos, go to playlist, and then notice I have a deserialized JSON. I have well, how many, 13 videos on how to do this. And I take it from easy to hard, you know, just every way that it can be done. And these are just some great videos. Uh, out of all the videos that I've made on my channel, these are the most viewed videos. So a lot of people are doing some learning here. So if you're new to it, I recommend go check out those videos. Or if you don't want to view those, you have to know how to deserialize JSON. And there you have the three new class files. Let's now start coding up main window XAML.cs. This is the code behind. The first thing we'll want to fix are our using clauses. Notice I have one to eight. Make sure yours match mine. I'm now going to press pause so you can make sure you have the same using statements and then I'm going to collapse my using statements. Now let's drop in our global variables. These right here are used throughout the program almost in every function. So these are very important. Notice that we have underscore cell color. It's an integer. It's an array. There are 30 elements. There's 30 elements because we have five characters for six opportunities. Five times six, 30. Then we have double underscore, dark gray, green, and gold. Those were the color of the cells. And I wanna know what character is in each of those. And then we have our current row, and this kind of tells me what row am I on. Remember, start at zero and work my way down. And then on line 21, all five letter words, when we deserialize that JSON data that we just downloaded, this is the field that it's gonna go into. Now let's jump into main window. Initialize component is something that comes generated. Now initialize app and attach all words to lbox all words. Those are our functions. I'm gonna comment them out so we don't have errors and just do one at a time. And it's now time to dive in line 27, initialize app. Initialize app calls another function on line 32. And then that function itself has four function calls. And these four functions is what initializes this app to run correctly. Notice that we're gonna load text block. We're gonna initialize cell colors. That's this variable up here. Then we're gonna load all those words that we just downloaded. And then we're gonna unlock row zero. Let's do it. Before we dive into load text block, notice I create a new text blocks control and then I'm dynamically gonna add it to the grid. Well, what if I didn't wanna do it this way? Well, can you imagine I came over to my XAML in main window.xaml and then I said block R0, column zero, so R0, C0, uh, C1, two, three, four, this is the first row. And notice I'm giving it a 
unique tag number. This is kind of like the offset of each field. And I just do this for all 30 text boxes. Well, I don't want all of this code inside of my XAML. It's kind of easier. And to be honest with you, what I'm about to show you, I use all the time. Like I'm in the inventory management business and I constantly have to build a palette. Well, sometimes I have 400 cases that go on a palette. You know, I don't want to have 400 lines. So once you learn this skill, I think you'll use it all over the place. So I'm going to remove these because really I don't do it this way. Now, how I do do it is this way. What I do is I dynamically create a text box. Notice on line 52, I say var tb equals new text block. And then I put some of the attributes on it, the fields. And here I say uid equals string.format. And then r, r0, 0 will go into this one. So I just keep building that based on these values r and c. Now there are several different ways that we could have done this line right here. Let me just show you a few. I could have came down here and just removed string format and uh, did it like that. That right there is legit as well. Now I could have done it one other way. I should have said string.format and then uh, open, let me see, we're gonna say R and then close it up and then say R comma C. And that is another way that we could have done this. So there are different ways that you can do that. Find a way that you're happy with and stick with it. Um, then on this text field, I'm going to initialize that as empty. When we assign characters that, this is the field that we're going to be putting our characters in there. I'm going to text align it to be in the center. That tag offset, I've already showed you that this is how we're going to be populating cell color based on this value. Tag is a unique number for each control. Then my font family, my font size, word wrapping. We only have one character. I kind of don't need this. And then notice here, I've got two fields on one line width equals height equals 60. Then if R is greater than zero, then I'm going to disable that first row. I mean, I'm going to keep that first row enabled and I'm going to disable the rest. Then notice here, I have an action, and this right here is a delegate. And what it's going to do is say, hey, preview mouse left button up. When this event fires, it's going to call this method here. And that method, let's see if I can move that over a little bit. This is a method, and when they do a mouse up, I'm going to go call this. And then we'll look at that in just a moment. But you notice inside of this code, I'm going to keep repeating all of this code for our 30 controls. I really don't want that in my XAML. And then I'm going to add this text block to the board. Remember, inside of our XAML, I said uh, this is an important word, the board. And then after I've created that, I'm going to say grid set row and then set column for that control at some offset. And that's how easy it is. And I'm going to do this 30 times. Here is all the source code for the method load text block. Press pause now and get all that typed in. Notice that you should go from lines 43 to 75. Notice on line 67, I told you we had an event, preview mouse left button up. And here's the method that will be called. Notice that's on line 77. Then what we do is we take that sender and I typecast that and I make it look like a text block. And I'm putting that into the variable control. I then have another method that we wrote called set offset get value. I'm sorry, get offset value. And I'm going to pass in that control. And then if that offset is negative one, I'm out of here. Else I go through here and I populate underscore cell color. Notice that I changed the background accordingly. Press pause now and that function TB preview mouse left button up is complete. We're now going to look at the function get offset value. Notice it's very, very simple. I'm going to send in that text blocks. I'm going to have a variable called control. I'm going to say, hey, if control equals null, you know, like I pass in something that doesn't exist, return negative one. Else, 
I have a nullable string and I'm going to get the tag value. And if that tag value not equal null, I'm going to parse that tag value and build an integer. Then I'm going to return that integer. Negative 1 means I didn't see it and we got an error. In fact, we got a big error. To recap our first function in the initialize app, we said load text blocks. That came down and built our 30 controls and then we assigned it to the board. We said the board children add tb. tb is a text block. Here are all my fields that I use. Then we came down there because I have a event. Here we can see that I have changed the value of cell color. This is a global variable. Remember it's an integer for 30. Offset is stored in tag. We see we can see that here. And tag offset, notice I start it with zero. And then notice here on my second for loop, as soon as I get done, I increment the tag offset plus plus. So I add one. So I just keep incrementing so it goes from zero uh, to 29. Then after we get done setting that, notice on line 80, we call another function, get offset value. And get offset value is going to take that text blocks. We have a attribute in there called tag, and I'm going to convert that from a string to an integer and then return that value. It's always one line of code that gets lost. Let me just show you all the code one more time and make sure you have it all. Notice the last line should be line 113. So get offset value starts at 101 and ends in 113. Make sure yours is the same. Our event TB preview mouse left button up starts at line 77 and goes down to 99. Here we're just setting the colors of the text box control and we're populating underscore cell color using the offset. Now, if, uh, I asked you, where does offset come from? You now know that comes from tag. It's an attribute on the text blocks control. And lastly, the load text block. Remember, I showed you how I would do it inside of XAML, and then I decided to do it this way. This is a learning way of doing it. In fact, I've told you I'm in a type of business where I have from 20 cases to go on a pallet to 400. There's no way I want to do all that in XAML. So this is the preferred way of doing that. Make sure that your code starts at line 43 and ends on line 75 for the function load text block. We are now going to look at initialize cell colors. On line 36, I say initialize cell colors. Remember, we have a global variable called underscore cell colors. Notice I'm going to initialize that to dark gray. Now, doing that, I'm also going to go through the board children of type text block. So I'm going to assign that to controls. Now, for each control, I'm now going to set the background to ghost white. Start on line 115 and end on 125. That's a very simple function. On line 38, we say load all five letter words. Notice that function is on line 127, 127 to 139. So what we're going to do is we're going to path out app data words.json. I'm going to make sure that file exists. And then I'm going to read all of that data and put it into this variable called JSON text. Now, because things happen, if JSON text is not equal null, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say JSON convert dot deserialize. And here we have a list of five letter words. Remember, there's this one column in here called words. And then we're going to make a list out of that. This is of type list five letter words. And that's what we're going to assign to the list in the app. Let's take a look at that. So here's that list I was talking about. So all 9,330 rows of data of five letter words are in this list. And that is the statement that did it. Here comes my first huge tip. Are you ready? 
See this file in app data.words? Well, as you can see, that's kind of like in this folder. But when we compile this program, it actually moves to another folder. But here, we have to do something special with this file. We have to come right click on this, say properties, and then notice here, it says none. We're saying, yeah, we want it to do something. We're gonna say contents, and then we're gonna say uh, always. So we're gonna make this content and then always copy that. So when we uh, compile this program, it's gonna take it from this local directory and then go deeper into the directory tree so we can be able to use that. Now, if you don't do that, the first time you run your program, this is gonna come up null and you'll be saying, uh, where's my data or something like that. Once again, load all five letter words begins at 127 and finishes on 135, 139. Make sure you're complete. On line 40, we're gonna write this method called unlock row zero. Now, what does that mean? Well, let's take a look at the app. Notice here, when I select a word from our list, it goes into a row. Notice how row one, two, all the way down, they're locked, unusable. When we say unlock, it makes it so these text blocks are available for data. So that is what this method does. Let's write that method. We'll uncome out at line 40 and then scroll down to lines 141 and that finishes on 160. Now this method pretty much makes it enabled. So notice on line 149, I say control.isenabled is true. You can remember when I created all these text blocks, I initialized them all to be false. So once they're true, we're gonna set the background color to dark gray, and then I'm gonna make sure that tag exists, and then I'm gonna go update cell color. Remember, this global variable tells me what color it is, and that color is very important. That's how we can use this app. Make sure you type all these lines of code from line 141 to 160, and that is unlock row. We're back to main window. We're gonna uncommon outline 29, and let's go look at this function. Notice, attach all words to L box all words. Notice, this is a global variable, all five letter words. I'm then gonna say this dot L box all words. Remember, this is the name of our list. And to get a list, a, a list of objects into that, we have to go through item source. So that the assignment. And then we go to button search dot content. I say search, and then I say how many are there available? Let's take a look at that. And see what I did. Notice here I say search nine three three zero. So that tells you how many words are totally available, which is a pretty cool command. Make sure you have lines 162 to 169 all typed in. And now we are done with our main window and our main window called initialize app. So we have finished this first section. Let's now collapse all the code from uh, main all the way down to attach all words to LBOX all words. And notice we have 171 rows of source code. Now is a good time to save. So come up to the button above and say, save all. I normally say there's two kinds of computer programmers, those that have lost code and those that will lose code. So make sure that we save and save often. We're now ready to start button search. Now button search has 15 functions to make that work. And that's roughly 305 lines of code. Now that's not gonna take very long to type that in. I know that sounds like a lot, but you know, like here you can already see like 50 lines. Now, I don't you worry about it. We're gonna go baby step and we're gonna understand it. But before we dive into this code, let's actually see how it works in real life. So notice here is the app. And notice the search bar and search button. And notice we have 9,330 rows. So when I come over here and I select a word, like imagine I wanted to select this word, R, and then I come over to the grid and I say, okay, you're in that word somewhere and you're in that position. So A can exist anywhere 
in R can only be in position three. When I hit the search button, I have to load up the list correctly, make sure we don't have dupes, and then go out there and find the words that map that, match that pattern. So here you see that using this pattern, we're now down to 112 rows. And then when I go pick the second word, uh, I would say, okay, let me see, A, R, and how about it has to end with N? Well, and notice now that is the word. That has to be the word because there is no other words that have this condition. What I'd like you to do now is press pause and go from line 171 to 205. The function actually ends at 213, so press pause now and then we can continue to 213. And notice at 213 it is at the bottom of that function. So let's talk about a button search. So button search is when I click on this button right here. And what it will do is it will go out to that list of words and start skinnying it down. We want to get down to only one word. So notice I have a new object and it is of type list five words. Well, we know five words only has one element in it, words. So here's just a new list. And then I'm gonna go get all of those words from this list. Now remember, whenever I like go pick a word and hit search, notice the, the list gets smaller. Notice I didn't select any. So that means like there is no A in this word, no A's. There are no R's, there are no G's, there are no H's. So notice from 9,000 down to 2,800. So that is the goal. And that I'm getting the actual new word list from that list. I'll show you how to do that in just a moment. And then we process that current row. Now notice here on line 174, I say var temp db equals get all that. Then notice here, I'm gonna loop over that word list and I'm gonna build a new word list. We'll have less words. One other thing to notice here is we're using character use state type. Remember, we did that as an enum. In our enum, we said there's an init, success, and fail. So notice here, I initialize it. Every time I get a new word on line 178, I initialize state to init. I don't know what's gonna happen, but it's possible that one of these functions, you know, like search green, search gold, search dark gray, they change the state. And I'm only gonna put it into this new list if it's success, or init, that's it. And I'm just gonna stay inside of this for loop and I'm just gonna keep kind of figuring it out what to do and then I'm gonna build the new list. And we saw in this previous example, I went from 9,000 words to 2,800 words. Let's now go look at get all words from ListBox. And notice it is a really small function. It begins on line 215 and it ends on 220. And what I'm going to do is for that list box, LB, all words, the item source, I'm going to typecast that, make it look like a list of five letter words. And I'm going to put that into data. And then I'm going to return data. So get all words from list box. So I'm gonna take all the words that are in here, and this is a control, and I'm gonna go through item source, and I'm gonna put that in data, and then I'm gonna return that. So notice on my second pass, there would only be 2,800 words in here. When we did our first pass, we had 9,000 and some, right? Okay, so that is get all words. Let's show you the source code of that one more time. And 215 to 220. Our next function we need to look at is process row. This is also another easy function. And notice that if the row is zero, we're gonna clean up those arrays, those objects that we use to keep track of what characters we can use. Now remember, there are three states for every character. There's a dark gray, and that means that character cannot be used anywhere. 
And then there's a green state that says, use this character in this position. And then gold means, well, this character can be used anywhere within these five characters. So we initialize it, and then we're gonna say load color type buckets. Notice the input to process row is the row. I'm then using row to go to our next function, load color type buckets. Notice I'm using that same row coming through here. Now you already know what this line does. The board children of type text block. This is gonna get all the controls. And guess what I'm doing? I'm saying I only want one row. So I'm gonna use controls and I'm gonna say where that uh, name starts with row sub zero and a C. We know that's the name of the, the uh, control. So now I have just five controls I wanna loop over. Then for each of those controls, notice that I'm just gonna, I'm gonna keep looping over that data and based on the color, I'm either gonna process it as dark, gold, or green. So to stay inside this loop, now notice that we have uh, three other functions before we get into the switch statement. And I'm gonna get the offset value, I'm gonna get the column value, and then I'm gonna get the value of the text. So these three functions just help me out before I get into here. And notice these values are the inputs to my functions, dark, gold, and green. Okay, let's go look at uh, the first one get offset value. What does that mean? We had already typed this one in and we'd already used it before, but normally what it does is, remember that offset? We had a global variable here called cell color. I told you that there are 30 elements of here. From the tag object, I can go in there and access one of these array elements. And that's what this get offset value is. I'm trying to get that tag value that tells me which of these cells to use. In this function, starting at line 265 to 275, get column value. I want to get the part of the name, the column. I don't know what it is. So notice I'm sending in my, my block, my text block, and I'm sending in the row number. Then notice I'm going to take the name and I'm going to replace R0C with nothing, which leaves me just the C value. And then I'm going to say, hey, if that's not null, let's do something. I'm then going to parse that text that only has the column, and I'm going to put it into column, and I'm going to return that. So this just gets the part of the name, the column index. Remember, it's R0C0, so I'm going to get that second zero. And then get text value from control. Well, you can imagine what that does. That begins at line 277 and goes down to 281. So I'm sending in that control. I'm going through control.text to string and to lower. I'm putting that into value and returning that. So notice these functions are small and very debuggable, right? So going back to this one right here, the goal of this one is to get this A out of this control. As you can see on line 242, I have the offset. Now I'm gonna be using that array cell color for that offset, and then I'm gonna switch. And I already know it's either a dark gray, a gold, or a green. That is the background color of that control. Now based on that background color is how I'm gonna process this. Let's make sure we understand when I say we're trying to select the color. Notice here, I have highlighted this second A and I said there's an A in this word sometime. But when I click on this, notice the color changes. So gray means this character is not used anywhere inside that word. When I say gold, that says this character is used anywhere. And R represents this absolute position. As we're looping over that, I know that, and I'm gonna process that dark, gold, and green. Let's do each of these. So process dark, notice that we're sending in the control, the offset, the column, and its value. 
the first thing I say is, is that character in green? And if it is in green already, uh, let's return. Let's don't even mess with this. And then I say, is that character in gold? Uh, let's return this. Remember, I'm trying to make this dark. Dark means don't use this character. Now, if it passes these two tests, what I'm going to say is, in that list called underscore underscore dark gray, if that already contains this letter, uh, don't do it again. We want unique characters in there. So that is process dark. Notice it begins on line 283 and ends on 293. Let's look at the next function, process gold. Process gold says, is character in dark collection? Well, if it's in dark collection, we have to remove it from there. And what that means is, like, the dark collection may have the letter A in there. And notice in this list, I go from left to right. So the first A would go into dark gray. Unfortunately, I'm using it in the second character, and I'm saying this is an absolute position. So for words that have duplicate same characters, like the A, you know, like in the word floss, two S's, there are many words that have two characters, uh, you know, the same letters. So we have to handle that appropriately. So in process gold, we have another function, and we say is character in dark gray collection. And I'm going to pass that there. Now, if that returns true, I'm going to remove it from that list. Now, once I remove it from that list, that means I can add it to gold. Remember, adding it to gold, I can have more than one character. I can have two A's, two S's, you know, whatever it takes. And those are telling me that this word has that collection of characters, but I don't know its absolute position. So hopefully you have finished up lines 283 to 293, process dark, 295 to 303, process gold. Now look at process green. Well, as you see, process green is almost just like process gold. Here we're saying, is character in that gray? And if it is, we have to remove it. And then what we do is we say in the collection, underscore, underscore green, let's add that column and its value. Green is very, very important because it tells me it has to be in that absolute position. Sweet. 305 to 313. Then we're going to come down to, is character in collection? Notice I'm going to send the color type and then its value. So here, using that color type, I say, if color type is green, then uh, let's use the list underscore underscore green. Now, if that color type is not green, we're going to use gold. And then I'm going to go loop through that and then try to find it. You know, if I find it, I'm going to set the found, you know, notice here on line 317, I say bull found is false. This is called a sentinel assignment. And then by default, if it never comes through here, found will be false. But if I come in here, do some testing, and I find out that value is in that list, then I'm going to set it to true. I'm going to break this loop. And now found is true, so I'm going to return true. And that is is character in collection. And this is the green and the gold test. Notice this function begins at line 315 and stops on 343. Above, we had to test to see if that character is in the dark collection. And if it is, we have to remove it. So here we're saying if underscore underscore dark gray count is greater than zero, that means it has some letters in it then I'm going to loop over that list. And for that value, if I find it in there, I'm going to remove it. I'm going to get out of here. So I never want to have a character in dark that is being consumed by either a gold or green character. That's what that function does. Notice this begins on line 345 and ends on 358. 
Our next function begins at line 360, ends at 375, is character in dark gray collection. I'm going to pass in that value. What is this called when we make an assignment like this? We call that a sentinel assignment. So we're saying found is false. If nothing happens in here, I'm going to return false. If underscore underscore dark gray count is greater than uh, zero, I'm going to loop around that and I'm going to say, hey, is that value in here somewhere? And if I find it, I'm going to set found to true. And then I'm going to return that. That's how is character in dark gray, dark gray collection is used. 360 to 375. These next three functions, search green, search gold, and search dark gray, we're going to be dealing with the actual word. So I'll be sending in the word, and then I'm going to say, does it, you know, match? Let's, let's see how I did green. Now notice search green is actually taking in a word. I'm looping over all of the words that are in this list, and I'm sending for this letter A, I want to find out which word in here has the letter A at position two. Position one actually uh, starts at zero. Okay, so notice that I do a separator. So I say an array of characters, and I'm calling that variable sep, and I'm putting a comma in there. And then I'm using a sentinel assignment for state. I'm saying, hey, I want you to initially equal init. Now, if the array uh, list, the list array green, has got more than zero entries, that means we have some values. And I want to make sure that uh, you know, we put our next value in here. Now, the list underscore underscore green, its content looks like this on line 386. There is a index and then the value. So you see that comma in between that? That is why I'm using this separator. So I say entry dot split that separator. So it's going to go into an array, this var key value. So it's key value. The key is one, the value is a. Let's see what that looks like. So if this was the entry right here, this is position zero, this is one. So when I split this, one will go into uh, sub zero, and then in key value sub one will be the letter A. So then on 389, I just do that simple test and I say, hey, is that character already in the green list? And if it is, I'm going to return success, or I'm going to say it failed. Then notice on line 399, I just returned state. And that's the function search green. It starts on 377 and ends on 400. Our next function, search gold, notice the input is word and the current state. I have that same step writer. I do that same test, but this time on gold, I say, hey, are there some entries in there? And then from line 409 to 432, I stay inside of a loop. Well, 431, I stay inside of this loop. Then I do that same split using that same technology that we just discussed in green. I use that separator, I split the values, and then for that position, I then look at that word and I say, hey, does it contain that character? And then if that is true, then I say, hey, at that position, notice I got that position at 412, does it not equal that value? And if it does not equal that, then I set that to success or it fails. And then notice this begins at 402, and then it ends in 435. Make sure you type that in, and then let's continue. Press pause or something. Thank you. The next function is called surge dark gray. Now dark gray, guess what? It uses the same pattern. So what we're going to do is we're going to, if dark gray count is greater than zero, Remember, when it's dark gray, what that really means is that character cannot be used in the word. So we're going to loop over dark gray. We're going to figure it out. We're going to test that character. If it's found, we're going to break. Notice I did a sentinel assignment on 445. I say found is false. I may, if I find it, I set it to true. And then if it's false, if that word contains that character, then I'm going to say that state is false. 
and then I'm going to return state. Notice state comes into it, so it's possible if everything fails, it just gets whatever state was sent in. Then I return state. Make sure that you type in from 437 to 471, and that is the function search dark gray. So there's the top of that. There's one, two more lines underneath. Ready? There's the bottom of that. And there you have it. So for the last 10 minutes or so, we have been looking at all the functions that make up button search click. We looked at get all words from the list. You now know that I look at the item source and that gives me a list of all the words. You understand what process row means. You know, if the row is zero, I initialize everything. Then I uh, just keep working my way through here. You understand what this character use state is. I initialize it at state. And notice on 197, I only put that word into the list to use it in step two, if and only if it's success or init. Remember, it is possible that, you know, I come through here and, you know, just everything goes into, you know, they're all gray. That means don't use these characters. It is possible that happens. So state management, big time. So look, loop over all the words, build, pass one list. Now, once I'm done with pass one list, look what I do to it. You have to set item source to null. You have to do that line. And then I'm building underscore pass one list. And notice I'm assigning that now to item source. And because we have finished another pass, I'm going to increment underscore current row. You know current row is a global variable. And now we are looking at the next row. On line 211, I'm now going to update the search button and I'm going to say, hey, you now have, you know, like 112 words in the list. And that there is the button search. It starts on 171 and then it ends on 213. Please take your time. Hit pause, you know, so you get all the source code. And just make sure the button search is 171 to 213. Now we're going to look at the clear all. The clear all resets this list and it clears out all the values. Now the values we know have two parts. They have a cell and then they have those three lists for dark gray, gold, and green. Let's reset all that. So notice the name of that control is button clear all and the method is called click. So I initialize the cell colors. I load all five letter words. I attach all the words to that list box. And then I set the current row to zero. I clear out dark gray, green, and gold. And then I unlock sub zero. Now look here on line 485. I set the board of type text block, and then I'm going to loop over that, and I'm going to set all the text values to empty. And then that puts us back into like a beginning state. Let's see how this would work inside of this app. Ready? Clear. Notice reset. My current row is zero, and my list is now full, 9,330 words. Our next method is when we are selecting words from the list box, there's a method called selection changed. And notice what it does is it goes and gets that selected word. And if that word is not null or not equal five characters, you know, because something weird happened, then I'm going to take that word and then I'm going to load the current row text box blocks. And then I'm going to unlock that row. So let's see what happens here. So notice here's my list. And when I click this, notice the, this word comes into the, these values. So that is what this on 501 load word into text block. I'm going to take that selected word and I'm going to put it into this row value. Let's see what that load word into text blocks does. 
Notice it's kind of simple, and what it does is it, I send in the selected word, I know what the row number is now, and notice I say control equals the board children of type text block. Then I loop over that, and because I know the row, then I'm going to say does that control name equal that, and then I'm going to put that value in there. Notice I'm always converting everything to lowercase. Regardless of how the input file comes in, I'm only ever going to show lowercase. I'm going to increment my offset. Now, why did I increment my offset? Well, my offset is very important. That is the value of the, the base layer. Remember, at the very top of our program, we had a thing called cell color, and the offset is based on where I'm at inside of this. So guess what? That is all the source code. Uh, we started here on line 12, and we started working our way down. And then we just did the search, you know, to uh, process that search, button search, had 15 functions in there. Then we did clear, then we uh, did the, uh, from the list, selection changed, and then we loaded it into the, the matrix. Then the program, keeps computing values. Let's now compile this program and see how it works. And there you have it, team, Wordle Solver. Uh, there was about 600 lines of code. Hopefully you were able to get all that done, and now you have a working app. Now what would be great is when you do it your way and you make changes and you make it better, somehow contact me and let me see what you've done with it. That would be pretty awesome, you know, like, uh, Always be sharing, that's what I say. And there you have it. Hopefully you enjoyed this video, and guess what? I'll see you back in my next video. Have a great week.